Hello YouTube, my name is Paul, hope you're all keeping well. Welcome back to the third part of the Q&As. Um, this is the mis miscellaneous part, so there's a lot of questions here about all kinds of stuff to do with my collecting. So yeah, there was one question I forgot to answer in the collection part, in the previous video. Uh, is there anything you regret selling? That was Jimmy Retro. And the only thing I ever regretted selling was my Atari ST back in 1990, because every time I sold something, I always bought something better. So when I sold my ST, I ended up buying a Ghetto Blaster, which was um, actually worse than the system I owned for the previous sort of five or six years. So yeah, and obviously I had nothing to play, uh, not until I bought a Mega Drive a couple of months later. And even then, at the age of 16 and not having a job, I couldn't afford the £40 for the games. So yeah, I did regret selling the ST. It was a little bit hasty. But the intention was to buy either an STE, um, which luckily I didn't because they're not a particularly great system. Because there was a lot of a lot of compatibility issues with that system. Um, but yeah, that's the only thing I regret selling. So miscellaneous questions. So if you if you could design your own game room from scratch with no limitations, what would it be like? That's from Burnt Out Culture, Mark. It's quite difficult. I wouldn't want a large games room. Um, I'd like a games room which was more practical because if you look around at the minute it feels more like a bloody warehouse than it does a games room so what I would like to have is a room that's big enough to hold the collection um, enough space in there so I can set the systems up that I want to use and one of those like they call collax sort of fixtures so not much different to anybody else's really have enough space on the wall as well to put some artwork up I can give you one example of a, of a room tour that I watched that I thought to myself, I'd love to have that. That's my games room. And that is a guy called King Arthur. His name is Tom. So I, I'll leave a link to that particular video in the description below. But that was an absolutely fantastic games room. Now if I could have all my collection and all my system set up with the artwork and a nice lounge area all hooked up to a really nice sound system, it would probably end up being a lot like King Arthur's room. So I look at people like uh, Last Gamer, who's got an absolutely incredible collection. Personally, it's just too much, personally for me, to go into a room. I don't think you can appreciate something of that scale. Um, well, I couldn't anyway, it's just too much. But yeah, check out King Arthur, that, that's pretty much how I would like my room. If I had the choice, which I could have the choice, I could sell half of what I've got in here and do something similar. But that's a bit of a dilemma, isn't it? Do I want to have a games room that's practical and I can use and enjoy, or do I want to have the collection that I've got? So... I suppose that's the choices you've got to make, isn't it? So thank you for that question, Mark. Uh, what does the better half make of your collecting or collection? That was from Tutu UK, Stu. And Jimmy Retro. Um, to be honest with you, she has a hobby herself, which is expensive. And she has horses. So if anybody who knows anybody who's got anything to do with horses, they are bloody expensive because all they do is bloody eat and they need somewhere to stay. And it needs some fields to kind of go around, really. So in, in itself, it's a very expensive hobby. So I don't get any qualms from a financial side, as long as I don't go overboard and put us in a precarious place. The only time you ever get any friction is when my stuff ends up coming out of this room and goes downstairs. I set a few computers up, or I've got games over the place so I'm trying to sort out and list. Um, it does get a little bit um, heated. Exactly the same as you bring stuff in the house relating to frigging horses. So it's a bit of both, really. You've got to live with each other's hobbies so generally i've been really lucky uh, over the years with different people so been quite lucky really but i know it can cause a lot of rows and a lot of resentment but it has never done that so thank you for those questions Stu and jim All right sega on nintendo that's from oh, who else would that be from sega zombie now it's going to be sega because i've got no history really with nintendo and I took a naive stance. So I look back and I think to myself, why did I do that? So I've always been someone who prefers computers to consoles, even back, well, back long, really. Um, and Nintendo, I always had the impression that their games were for kids. That's what I mean by naivety. They're one of the first companies that I can think of that were politically correct, because there was no blood. Um, and a lot of what they did, really, was actually quite pioneering in terms of the way their ethics were in, the, in their games because it's kind of gone a bit like that nowadays really um but yeah like i said i never had much to do with it and every time i saw a nintendo especially the original boxy ones i didn't like the look of them and i already had a 16-bit computer so they kind of looked dated and i went through a period then of like not using computers and consoles at all so i kind of missed the super nintendo altogether because i had the mega drive 
even though I had no game. So yeah, very much around naivety and lack of interest really, because I've never really been exposed to them, and my preferred choice has always been computers. And Sega Mega Drive mostly sat there, unless my mate bought a game, which I used to borrow for him and play them, because the Mega Drive was an amazing computer. I never had a Master System, again, exactly the same as the NES. It looked a bit dated. Um, some, crack, some, get me wrong, some cracking games on the systems. I do regret it sometimes as well, because some of the best franchises or best game, standalone games ever made came out on Nintendo, so I've missed a lot, really. And it's a very expensive system to collect for now, so... I suppose in the future I'd like to rectify that and pick up some of the big sellers or the better known games on the system just to give them a go. So I do feel now, now in older or later life, sorry, that I've missed out. Because of my foolishness. So if there was one game you've played that you could make even better, what game was it? And what would you improve, do to improve it? Now... I'm very lucky that I've never really gone out and bought games that I've really disliked, except for maybe a handful. And if one game stood out, this was mentioned by my old mate Dave, Retro Games Play Badly, that's Renegade 3. It's almost a pointless release. Why did they release that game anyway? I understand why they did, because it's a money maker. But the game had no bearing really to the previous two. It was done by a completely different developer, or development team, to the original two. Uh, the game mechanic was crap, because all you did was punch or kick whatever flipping era you was in. Could it either be bloody prehistoric times or the future. It just completely took the Renegade franchise completely off the rails. So if I was to think about it, the best thing they could have done with that game was fucking scrapped it. Um, but yeah, it's no point making another game which is very similar to the previous two, because I don't think the Spectrum could have done much better really than Target Renegade. So it's a shame, really. But yeah, it was let down by many things, not only the game mechanics, the locations, the fact that it was completely unbelievable. Ruined the game. That was from the Retro Bear. So thank you for the question. There's, there's, there are other games like that, but that's the one game that probably always stuck in my mind. Uh, another one would probably be Chase HQ. I put a bonus one in Chase HQ only because if they would have used the same development team the 8-bit guys had, um, if you ever saw Batman the movie's driving sequences, that would have been Chase HQ on our 16-bit home computers. It would have been flipping fantastic. But it's a shame. They're probably the two that stick out, but definitely Renegade 3. So you are any animals, mate? Yep, two dogs. We have two dogs. Um, quite recently as well. I've never had pets, really, as an adult. And two years ago we got a dog, and six months later we got another one. Which, I tell you what, I can never ever do without now, because they're absolutely fantastic loyal creatures doesn't matter how your day is and what you do and say they're always there no matter what I mean, humans can uh, learn a lot from animals i'll tell you that so yeah two dogs now some cats games whatever so thank you for asking that he's also asked another question so with games shipping out incomplete or requiring large sometimes day one patches do you still think it's feasible to collect for modern consoles if you can't play that same disc 15 to 20 years down the road without said update or patch? It's a very good question. Um, yeah, I, I personally don't think most modern systems are going, to be, are going to be worth anything. Not systems as such, because some limited edition or, or really hard to get collector's editions will, I think, be collectible for definite. But I think anything beyond sort of the Dreamcast and GameCube, I just don't believe they will. Um, because they're they're available in such large numbers. People do collect them now. I collect the collector's editions for the PS3. More for what's in the box than the game. Because um, one thing that bothered me was when I, I dug out my old Medal of Honor for my PC. I couldn't play it because obviously it's incompatible now with modern day operating systems and drivers. So I had to pay for it again via GOG to play it. That's only two or three quid. But I can't see how it's going to be feasible because you're going to play a game that is... Not actually complete. You're going to play a broken game. A lot of these games do require you to link up as well to the network. Or PlayStation Network or the Xbox Network. So I don't. And I think... I don't, I don't think it will, it will be feasible. I'll be completely honest with you. But I think if people are going to collect stuff for it, it's going to be... Yeah, I don't, I, I don't know. It's, very, it's a very difficult one. It'd be interesting to know what you guys think in the comments below. But I don't think it is, personally. But that's why I've only really collected the limited and collector's editions for those systems. 
I mean, there's so many games out there that's so common. I mean, even now, I mean, what's a PlayStation 3? What, 13, 12, 13 years old? I mean, when a Spectrum was that old, there were games that were had actually got a decent value, even on the Mega Drive, when I first started collecting. But I don't see the same thing, really, for the PlayStation 3 or Xbox. So, yeah, very good question. I, I don't think they will be. Even if I collected them in 20 years' time, I'll be an old man. I'll be 65. I don't think I'll even want to be flipping wanting to play those games to be honest because yeah the double dexterity is probably long gone by that point but yeah very good question very very good one to ponder over so do your family and friends or even work colleagues know about your youtube channel if not why not they do i have no embarrassment at all talking about my youtube channel the only time i ever get embarrassed about it if it's if if someone turned up now whilst i'm making this video i'll turn it off because i i would be i would cringe i think knowing that someone's in the house while I'm making a video but to talk about it I ain't got a problem with that but the guys at work know about it and they, they think it's really good simply because I'm not I'm not an extrovert person I'm quite quiet um not like to the point I'm mega shy but I am I am quite quiet and I'm very much I am an introvert uh, which I think a lot of people that do these channels actually are to be honest with you but yeah I don't so yeah I've got no no problem sharing that I do YouTube and I think most people think it's a really good thing. I've had people ask me about it, as in like, how do you do it, and how do you set it up, and how do you feel about doing it, and the rest of it, and it's great, really good. So that was uh, JW, so thank you for that, Jay. So anyways, Desert Island Games. If you were on a desert island, what three games would you have with you, and why these games? And that's Dylan Craven. Now, Desert Island, I could be stuck on that for a very long time, unless, of course, I make a raft. And get a friend called Wilson. So until I get a friend called Wilson and make a raft, I'll take The Witcher 3 with me, because I've never played it. It's been sat here for a long time now. I've actually started it on the PC, but never finished it. And it is an absolutely amazing game, from what I've read. Probably one of the best games ever made. So I'll take that along. And a franchise I used to absolutely love up until about 2004 was Championship Manager, which is now obviously called Football Manager. So I'd buy the latest incarnation of that, and I'll play it, because I've got the time to do it. And the reason I fell out of love with that series, not only because there was lots of bugs in it, but it took forever to play. Um, a third game. Not really sure on the third one, to be completely honest with you. I wouldn't take anything old and retro, because I find that most games are fantastic pick-up-and-play games, but not really the sorts of games... They're the sorts of games though, that you'll get bored of quite quickly. And I like a lot of these games in small doses, because you can basically play them for about 15 minutes to an hour, and they're brilliant. If I'm stuck on an island for flipping eternity, I won't pick those. Um, I'm trying to think what other game I would pick. Might come back to that one. I'll tell you another game I would pick, actually, is, is Fallout 3. The reason why is I've never finished playing the game throughout. I mean, I've completed um, New Vegas. I've bought all the DLC and played it again and again and again. Whereas Fallout 3, I didn't do that, so I'll probably take that with me. And indulge myself. So Fallout 3, including its DLC... The Witcher 3 and its DLC, and Football Manager 2019. They'll be the free games, so they should keep me occupied for a few months and then anyway. Right, what is your favourite, your number one favourite YouTube channel? Mine is Kid Shoryuken. That's from Nick Berry, I don't have one. I don't, I subscribe to quite a lot of people. Dozens and dozens of people. Um, and they all have something great about their channels. Um, they've all got great they're all great people. It's just they've all got something about them, about having, say, different collections to me. Nintendo, predominantly, is I don't have Nintendo or PC Engine or something I'm interested in, but never likely to probably get. Um, or they grew up in a similar era to myself, and they've got a lot of memories that I can relate to. There's many reasons why I watch these guys. I don't watch a particular person and think if that person disappeared, that would be the end of my world. I've never been that sort of person myself. So I watch a multitude of different channels. I haven't got a favourite. There's lots of favourites. That's it, really. So thank you for that, Nick. Anyway, but yeah. Retro bang up. Oh, man, now I've been flipping jails. I've got off my desert island. Now I've been banged up. You find yourself in solitary confinement for six months with just an Amiga to keep you company. Ooh. You're allowed one game. Which would it be and why? That's from Lukey Boy 67 Or Lucas Rainford, isn't it? What would I do? I'd probably go for The Settlers. Uh, the Settlers is a game I used to spend absolutely hours on. 
Um, but I only ever did the, not the campaign, I did the, um, you can make up your own maps and make up what you wanted on that map. So that's what I used to do. And I used to spend probably 50, 60 hours on a said map building it up and then obviously going to war. But that's probably the one game I'd like to actually go through the campaign. I think I got as far as the second campaign. That's about as far as I ever got. But I certainly would take that and it would be something to take my mind off solitary confinement. There's many fantastic Amiga games, but like I said previously, once you played them probably for a couple of days or so, you might get a little bit bored. I thought about Championship Manager, but again, that game it is quite buggy after a certain point. But even if I played it as four teams, what I used to play, four, four teams, Championship Manager, you could probably play a season quite easily in, in a couple of days. Or even a day even, I think, so that wouldn't last very long. So I will go for the Settlers. If I was to pick a second one, it'd probably be Liberation, because that's a massive game. And a cracking one too. But yeah, Settlers. Right, so what was the worst expletive uttered from young Paul after experiencing an R-tape loading error? Flipping L doesn't count. That's from Darren McCowan. Now, if I swore in my household when I was a youngster, I'd probably imagine a foot coming through the wall into my neck. So, yeah, I would never swear at home. I never swear in front of my parents even today. But the chances are that tape deck would have got a good old punch or the joystick may have been strangled to the point I snapped it in half. So I probably would have taken my frustration out in that way, really, rather than swear. I think uh, the consequences of me swearing are probably greater than probably the consequences of me breaking my joystick. But yeah, so yeah, I swear a lot now. Uh, the C word springs to mind. I had a lot nowadays, but I never, ever would have said that as a kid. I'll tell you that now. <laughs> I probably would never see my spectrum again. So what's your favourite... Oh, that was, yeah, Darren, yeah, Darren. So what's your favourite collector's edition and why? Content is value for money. Glory Hunter 82. Uh, again, a tough one. Um, tough one. The Witcher 3 box set, I, I think, is fantastic. I like the sort of weighty statues, the ones that have a lot of detail in them. Um, some of them are quite light, aren't they? They feel quite cheap and nasty. But the Witcher 3, yeah, you've got a nice still book in there. You've got some other trinkets as well, which you would come across in the game. And the statue is, is brilliant. I would say that one. Uh, another one I really like is the Resident Evil 7 one, which, uh, if you didn't know, was a game exclusive, but they didn't send it out to the people that all pre-ordered them because they were mostly damaged. So I had to pick one off of eBay, but the US one is brilliant. It's a flipping music box mansion. Fantastic. The actual ornament inside the Resident Evil 7 box is great. It's just the rest of the, the rest of the actual collector's edition isn't very good. Um, what other ones do I like? Uh, the Last Guardian is another one. It's got an absolutely fantastic statue in it. I'm probably going to go for The Witcher 3, I would say, for now. But what I'd like to do at some point is start going through a lot of these collector's editions because some are still sealed. I do have the standalone games, but I don't have the, them on display, the actual collector's editions anywhere. But I would like to go through them and have a good old gander. But yeah, I'm going to go for The Witcher 3. That's probably the best one I've seen so far. So if you can go back to one particular moment in time to play a game, what moment and game would it be? Obviously explaining why would be a great interest too. That's from Clay Graphics. Now, I suppose the first game I ever really properly got hyped up about. I mean, like read every preview, review, studied every picture. Do you know what I mean? It was Operation Wolf. Now, I played it in the arcade very briefly. I didn't use the arcades a lot, to be honest, when I was a kid. Uh, but I remember seeing it. And for its time, it was an absolutely fantastic arcade game. Um, it just looked different. Obviously, you had the gun in the front and that. But when they said it was bringing it to the Spectrum amongst the other home computers, I, I couldn't believe it. I was absolutely chuffed to bits. And when I saw the preview and I saw like the Arnold Schwarzenegger character, uh, it looked absolutely amazing. And then I think we got a cover disc of it. Not cover disc, what am I talking about? A cassette. Which put a cassette in, loaded a demo up and, and played a demo of that game. And it just absolutely blew me away. I mean, I've never been this hyped for a game as much as I was for Operation Wolf. And then going out to get it, went to the computer show. It's like a, a horticultural society building, whatever it is in Victoria. I'm not sure if it's still there, to be honest. Went there with my, good, my best mate, and we went there on a nice frosty morning and picked it up, and I had to take it home. Obviously played it for a bit, and I gave it to my mum to, or my parents, to wrap up. But yeah, I think it's the whole experience, not only of the game, because it was an excellent conversion on the Sinclair Spectrum. It was just a very... I just like I just enjoyed the whole process from the start of the old previews and 
knowing it's going to be released on the Spectrum in particular, to actually play in it. But my friend also had it on his Android CPC, so I remember vividly going around his house at lunchtime from school and playing that game. I just think the whole thing was memorable because because of the whole experience, literally from start to finish. From opening it up on Christmas Day, thinking I've played this game already. But yeah, it was, it was brilliant, and it was one of the first games I really, really got hyped up about. But yeah, it's brilliant. That's from Clay Graphics. I already said that. So thank you for your question. Uh, if you could go back... Done that already. If you could take just one game back from the current generation to show little Mr. Bads as a kid, what would it be? That's also from Clay Graphics. That one game, my friend, would be Grand Theft Auto V. Now, as a kid, or when I was younger, I always wanted to play a game when you had the freedom to go anywhere. Um, drive anything, fly anything, kill anything, do whatever you want to do. And Grand Theft Auto 3, when I first played that, was about the closest I ever got to my ideal game. That's the one game I always wanted to play. From early games like Damocles, where you can explore whole worlds, it was a very empty, sparse environment. But that was like amazing, amazing experience, even though it was, yeah, it was quite an empty world, but to do that was brilliant. So Grand Theft Auto V is probably the pinnacle of that series. And that's the one I take back to Little Mr. Bads, back to 1980, I don't know, when I started thinking about these games, 1990 Damocles would have been out, if I showed him that there, and he would have probably pissed himself. At what age do you decide that the world of video games was for you? I thought that's probably the moment I played combat. Especially the moment I played um, Miss Pac-Man. That was on Sultry Little Bird, wasn't it, eh? Bloody hell. Well, my old man used to play Miss Pac-Man. Seriously, lock himself in a room and play it for flipping hours. He was addicted to the point that when he stopped doing that, he never touched the console again. But yeah, that was brilliant. So yeah, my dad was certainly hooked on it. But yeah, it was definitely when we got the Atari, which was the very first system. So that was another question from Fernando. Got the Atari uh, 2600 or VCS back in 1982. I remember my dad getting combat and he ordered Miss Pac-Man and Vanguard, which were two really good games. Two games I've got back in the collection now, thankfully. But those, they, those were the first three games, really, that really got me into gaming. So from about 82, I did play some kind of Pong variant, but it was pretty crap, to be honest, even back then. So yeah. So the first system wasn't decided for me. Just got it, which is cool. The first system I actually got for myself was a Sinclair Spectrum and, and I got that specifically because when I used to stay at my auntie's place that's the games, the system she had the old rubber key one, so games like Manic Miner um, I don't know, Cookie I can remember, Penetrator she had quite a few old classic games on it and that's why I chose the Sinclair Spectrum because a friend of mine who lived across the way had a Commodore 64 and it's a funny story, I remember taking my cassette, a blank cassette over to my mate to his, to his house so can you put some Commodore 64 games on there so I can play on my Spectrum? So yeah, to my annoyance, obviously that wasn't going to happen. But, God, I was thick as a kid, I tell you. Uh, do you believe the Amiga version of Silk Chrome to be better than the arcade or not? That's from Jim Crom. And before I started making this video, Jim, I played both versions. And the arcade version isn't as good as the Amiga for the following reasons. A, the Amiga's got superior sound and music, which is fantastic. B, the playing area on the Amiga, you can actually see more of what's going on, whereas the arcade one is quite a tight playing area. And I couldn't even get off level 1 after, until after about 15 attempts. And then I played the Amiga version afterwards and got to level 5, and then played the Amiga one for at least 2 years. Um, the graphics are better on the arcade, as you would expect. It's smoother on the arcade, but the fact it's more forgiving on the Amiga as well, which it would be because it's not sucking away my 10 Ps, makes it a better game in my opinion. So yeah, I think the Amiga version is the better version, I've got to say. It's probably the best home computer version as well. Um, if you had any space to put three game boxes on display for their awesome artwork, what would they be? That was Olive, Oliver TV, and he did mention Psygnosis. Now for me, I've got a couple of them in frames for my ideal games room whenever that will come up. Um, I've got a few actually, so one of the most iconic pieces of art for me, which would be displayed, was Renegade by the late Bob Wakelin. Now again, an absolutely iconic piece of game and artwork. Fantastic. Absolutely love it. And kind of depicts the era and the game very, very well. So that'll be the first one. I'll go straight on my wall. And as mentioned uh, previously from a, an a very strong nostalgic experience, Operation Wolf. 
would also adorn the wall next to Renegade. Now, Bob Wakelin produced a lot of fantastic artwork. I mean, I love Where Times Are Still. That was an amazing piece of artwork. And also, uh, Billy the Kid, even though it never got a release. But another cracking one was Batman the Cape Crusader. So I definitely would have Operation Wolf. I definitely would have Renegade. Amongst many different ones I'd love to have. But if I was going to pick a Psygnosis one that I like, I do like Blood Bunny. So I'm pretty sure the artwork for a lot of the Psygnosis games were, done, were not originally designed or commissioned for Psygnosis. So... Yeah, I love Blood Money's artwork. Again, it reminds me of a, a great era and a, and a great friend. So yeah, there could be anything. Even, even, I even dug out the most recent game I'm still playing. And I never really paid much attention to the box. <laughs> to be honest, I don't pay attention to much. And that's Days Gone. But if you look at the artwork on that, I mean, I, I love it. Look at that horde. I faced my first horde the other day. Flipping out, it scared the shit out of me. Like a properly chased me down. Yeah, you just sometimes you don't really appreciate some of the modern stuff is great, but you just don't really take the chance to look at it. It's lots of Japanese games that got fantastic artwork, but for me personally, it'd be the two ocean games: Operation Wolf, uh, Renegade, and probably Blood Money. To be completely honest with you, but thank you for asking, Oli um, Oliver TV. Um, but there's so many to choose from. There's probably hundreds, hundreds of games, literally, with fantastic artwork on them. But yeah. Uh, so my question is out of all the games you've played what is your favourite game of all time without further ado retro now that's a really really tough question because I always like to break them down by genre but if I was to pick a game it would be the first game of its type I probably ever played it would be the first game I ever went out and bought DLC for so I absolutely loved this game and I never in a million years would have thought I'd have played this game. I don't have it anymore. I brought it to my son and never saw it back. And that game is Dragon Age Origins. Absolutely amazing game. There was a person in work I used to speak to. And she was very quiet, actually. Very kind of introvert. But her, her face would light up talking about Dragon Age Origins. And the sequel wasn't even a portion of that game. And I absolutely loved it. I never played those sorts of games before. An RPG with all these sort of, sort of like fantasy creatures and ermine. Wizards, wizards and stuff, which is quite strange coming from someone who plays lots of games. Because they're all bloody fantasy games, aren't they, really? But yeah, I absolutely love Dragon Age Origins. I haven't played Inquisition, which might be another game I could take with me on my desert island. Mind you, I picked my three, haven't I? So it's tough luck. But yeah, I, I heard they're making the number four as well. But I've played the first one, which was amazing. I've played it through about three or four times. Brilliant game. Um, but a really tough one to answer, but that's the one I would go for because that's the sort of game once you play it it's got its claws stuck into you and you can't let it go so I've picked one but there's many many cracking games that I do love I do absolutely love a lot of the modern stuff C Company of Heroes was one of my favourite RTS games of all time again I've played that one through many times and it's sequel uh, but yeah Dragon Age really that's it. So I've got another question around top systems and games. So tell me which are your top three gaming systems and favourite game on each one. Now I might do that when I do my... Sorry, I will do that when I do my collection videos. Um, and that was asked by It's a Pixel Thing. So thank you very much for asking. I will answer that, but I'll answer it in each of the videos that I do. The three systems, though, I'd pick would be the Sinclair Spectrum, because that's the first system I had as in for myself, and I've got loads of fond memories. The second one would be the Amiga. Even though I had an ST, the Amiga would, was always the system that I wanted, because um, it was always superior. Not always superior, that's slightly wrong, but it was superior the majority of the time. And if I picked another system, it would be either the PlayStation or the Mega Drive. It would probably be the Mega Drive, to be honest. Um, so I've got a lot more experience with the Mega Drive than I have for the PlayStation. So yeah, they're four of my favourite systems, but I definitely would go for the Sinclair Spectrum, Commodore Amiga, Sega Mega Drive as my free system. So when I do those videos, as with all of them, I will highlight my favourite games on those systems. Now the other question I haven't answered is, what is your most memorable video game moments and why? That's Nintendo Arcade. So I'll probably incorporate that into the same set of videos, to be honest. Because um, unless I look at the artwork on them, I kind of forget. I mean, even simple things like playing Platoon. I mean, Platoon on the Spectrum, you'd think would be a pretty average game. 
but you're kind of going through the tunnel network and it's the first time I've ever experienced a game not it's not 3d but it's kind of a pseudo 3d you're kind of walking forward and all the rest of it um and this fucker jumped out of the water and literally i jumped feet and i smacked my head against a friggin wall but there's so many different things like that that happened in games that wowed me at the time but i have to really give it some thought and think about it because yeah there's loads of moments even in a modern game like crisis when a nuclear explosion went off and, and you're standing nowhere near it but the force of the explosion and the shockwave literally blew all the trees forward. It was flipping incredible, that part of the game. We're in the Crisis 2 and in the train station. And all hell's breaking loose. And this gigantic flipping enemies literally over the train station. The whole the whole scene of that was amazing. But there's so many different things. Even, even Bioshock, when you had that twist in the plot. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant experience. That was never expected that. But I have to really give that one some thought. Because it's an absolutely fantastic question. As they all are, but... That one does provoke, yeah, I've got to provoke a few memories there, just so I remember, really. Right, if you start, sorry, if you could be part of any computer arcade game like Turrican, Roland or Monkey Island, what part would you be? Ash ate one before you. Now I've got a cracking game I would love to be part of. That game is called Lula. Now Lula, uh, <laughs> it's called Lula the Sexy Empire. Now I'd like to be her pimp. There you go. So that's what I'd love to be in a computer game. So otherwise you're going to be some nice little character doing the usual thing. But yeah, pimp. Imagine that. Bloody hell. Never tried that myself. Certainly something I'm not going to try between now and the time I die. But if I was going to be a computer character, it'd be him. I can't remember what he's called, actually. I can't get hold of the box to um, tell you the character's name. It's an absolute shit game, but I've got to be honest. Yeah, you've got to check out some footage of that game. Ash, you'll like it. Did you ever use the trainers to add cheats to games, either at the start of a copy game or with action replay game, genies, etc.? That was roller core. And the answer to that is no. Never. Um, I would never touch a pirated disc. I'm a, I'm a fussy shit like that. When I had my games, if it was a copy game, I probably wouldn't touch it. Um, don't know why. Got no idea why I would do that. But... Because I never used them, I never cheated. I did cheat using magazine codes and pokes years ago into original games, but I never had anything like that. I think the only game that might have come on a disc that I had like that was Human Killing Machine. And that was paired with something else. But no, I never used any of the trainers or any of the cheats. Believe it or not, but no. But yeah, that's it. That's, that's the miscellaneous. And I think that is all the questions, except for obviously it's a pixel thing. And Nintendo Arcade, which I will expand on those because they're very good. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for taking part in the Q&A. What I'll do is I'll do the draw as per usual in the coming days. <clears throat> to find out which one of you have won. It's easily my most popular competition. Got to be a 35 to 40 entrance with some fantastic questions. I hope you enjoyed the series of videos I put out there. And thank you very much for watching. And thank you very much for subscribing. I'll see you guys again real soon. So take care and bye for now.